Thank you all so much. Looks like we just started recording. Uh, yes, my, my name is Alexandra Bowman, and I am currently the cartoonist working with John Kerry's environmental news organization, World War Zero. Uh, it's a long story. Uh, I was working for Our Daily Planet, and then they meshed with John Kerry's organization. So that's where I am now. I am a senior at Georgetown, uh, double majoring in English and art, and I'm also in the ABMA English program. So two of my five classes, again, I said I would keep this short. I'll keep this short. Uh, two of my five classes are uh, master's classes. So I'll be graduating with a master's degree in May 2023. Um, so I'm, I'm doing my best to balance as much as possible. I'm very excited to hear uh, tips from experts about how to stop worrying and love the doom because that is how it feels a lot of the time. Uh, but I thought that we could start with just a couple questions to get us started. Um, and I have full faith that the conversation will pick up and flow um, so after that. And if it doesn't, I have more questions, but I have faith in our ability to talk for hours and hours and hours. So um, I thought maybe we could all go around. I say this knowing like I am so young and inexperienced compared to the rest of you guys. So uh, moderator of a panel like this is an interesting niche for me to serve in. Uh, but I thought we could go around and uh, maybe you could say your name and your public and then also um, your work routine now. And I think that might be an interesting preface for a question I have in a minute um, on how people's work routines changed before, during, and after the pandemic. Um, and just because I know that people are in a different arrangement on everyone's screen, I thought I could call on people uh, to go in an order. So um, how about we start with uh, Kelsey is not, she's not a cartoonist, I don't think. Or maybe she is. Uh, how about we start with Steve? <laughs> hey, great. Yep. Steve Stedlin. Um, I'm with the Charleston City Paper. I've been it's all weekly here in Charleston, South Carolina. I've been with them since 2004. Um, and yeah, so my routine is it's a weekly. So I basically spend the weekends scrambling to get a cartoon done uh, for their Monday deadline. So. Fantastic. How about Scott Stantis next? Hi, everyone. I'm Scott. I work, I do two cartoons a week for the Chicago Tribune. I do one cartoon a week for counterpoint.com. I also do the DMZ America podcast and the Counterpoint Countercast podcast, hence the microphone. And uh, I've tried to fill up my week. I try to take one day a week off, a Saturday, and the rest of the time is, you know, staring at blank pieces of paper until beads of blood appear on my forehead. Excellent. Very doomy. Let's get, let's stay with that, that theme. Uh, how about Sage next? Hi, I'm Sage Dossel. Um, currently doing um, kind of like long form cartoons for the Boston Globe uh, for a number of years. I was um, working at the Atlantic Monthly and also doing contributing um, cartoons for their website. And I still occasionally do kind of one off stuff and um, send them places. So. Awesome. And my routine, um, yeah. So I'm on kind of a rotation, rotating schedule with some other cartoonists. So I have certain weeks that are kind of, I talk, call them my torture weeks that are very stressful. Um, it's currently one of those weekends, but, um, and then and then I have the, the period of great relief um, and then back on. So that's my schedule. Awesome. <laughs> or maybe not awesome. Uh, yeah. And then how about uh, Kevin next? Hi, I'm Kevin Necessary. I'm the editor of cartoons for the Cincinnati Inquirer. Uh, I do around one to two cartoons for the Inquirer each week. Uh, so that's uh, a lot of scrambling on Wednesdays and Thursdays, trying to uh, get into editorial cartoon mode. And, uh, you know, usually I'm skirting the deadline on Thursdays and I'm having the, you know, the page designer uh, sending me an email around two o'clock saying, hey, did you send your cartoon in yet? And he knows full well that I haven't. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I also do uh, you know at least one cartoon a week for Go Comics, and that's pretty much just whenever inspiration strikes. Um, and then I do a lot of freelance work, you know, in the week. So I'm you know Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays are freelance. Uh, Fridays and Saturdays are Fridays and Sundays are also uh, other illustration, and Wednesdays and Thursdays are very heavily just staring at the news, trying to pretend that I'm, you know, that I understand things and drawing as fast as I can. Ooh, I'm excited to talk about uh, what it's like to work as a political cartoonist when you're an English and art person, as opposed to someone with maybe a political science background. I don't know, that's a little bit off the beaten path. I'm personally very interested to hear your takes on that. Uh, how about, and JP, do you want to introduce yourself? 
<laughs> do you count? I don't know if you count. Uh, no, I'm just the voice in your head. Great. Excellent. <laughs> one of many. All right. Um, so one question I have is, did you all go through some kind of deep emotional valley during the pandemic? Who did? <laughs> Who did? Okay. Okay. We all, okay. Darn. I was excited to see if there was someone who didn't so we could ask them what, you know, oh, okay. Sage. Oh, okay. Well, I, I did, but I feel like um, I was one of those weird people who um, in some way, like I feel guilty about this, that, um, you know, it, it kind of temperamentally, like, you know, I'm sort of a recluse. So it was kind of like, oh, finally, I, you know, I go from like, oh, what's wrong with you? You want to be home? And, uh, you know, it was kind of like, oh, I'm, uh, you want me to do that? Oh, all right. I guess I can, you know, bear with that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very, like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a natural introvert, and I would assume that most people who totally, yeah, yeah, at drawing boards are. So my wife is a major extrovert, and I think that you know it was harder on her. Whereas, like, I'm like, oh, I'm, I get to sit on the couch and build Legos and draw. That's great. <laughs> for me it was I, I i left the tribune on my own volition i just was I, I you know i saw it was in the mail so i decided to kind of make the transition to freelance myself by the time i'd done that i'd already uh, worked out a schedule where i went into the office probably twice a week maybe three times but mostly twice a week which was can you be an extrovert and an introvert at the same time i think you can and uh, for we, me, the Hilltop Show did a headline yesterday about, uh, yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good question because there's time, every cartoonist I know is usually vivacious and interesting and very good conversationalist, but there's that point in the time of your day where you, if you're doing a daily cartoon, where you just have to be by yourself and shut the door and do the work and no one can bother you. I had to fight that battle for years about working from home. And then of course this happened, then COVID happened. And, you know, uh, it just uh, facilitated my a transition I'd always wanted to make. And so happily I did. You know, what's, uh, so I, I started at the Enquirer in January of 2020. And I was, uh, I was given, or I was allowed to use the, you know, the uh, office of my predecessor who left in 2008. And so I, like I was in there once or twice a week for maybe two months before the pandemic hit. And you know, it was it was kind of fun going back into an office, and then it was like, okay, I'm I'm home, and I don't need to ever go into an office again. Yeah, I, I left the office oh. years ago, and then my office migrated away, and that actually, what despite being an introvert, I did really miss kind of having a commute, clearing my head as I got there, kind of like bouncing off other live people and that kind of thing. So, but I had already made the adjustment a few years earlier, so I felt like I was kind of already there. My adjustment was that my son um got his, his school shut down so then i had this little person underfoot all the time so i didn't have any brain space how old your how old was your son he was five at the time now he's seven oh so. god bless you Told yeah, in, in my not little not student world, like I had this deep, visceral longing to go back to Georgetown for a year and a half. And I, I would like have dreams where I would be in our library and it was, it was weird. And then I got back and within a week, I'm like, please bring me back to that <laughs> heaven that I used to be in, please. Like, it's funny. And this is a whole tangent, but it feels like the standards for our education were so low <laughs> for a year and a half. And then they went to like, if you don't show up every time. It, it, the standards changed dramatically, and I don't understand why we couldn't potentially have a week, a month, or we're all virtual. It would help with COVID and everything, but it for me, it was a bigger transition and more of an emotional transition than I expected. Um, was it emotionally difficult or startling for you all to go back to a significantly different situation, or maybe you didn't go back to a significantly different situation based on your situation? <laughs> I haven't gone back to, I've, I still, I, I work in the Chicago Tribune, but I live down here in Birmingham, Alabama. So, so far. <laughs> yeah, but we got in tech and definitely the office closed down. And that was beautiful at the beginning of the pandemic, like you were saying, you know, being an introvert, didn't have to go anywhere, could, could stay home, work from home. Instead of having a commute, got up for me on the artwork. So it was very fulfilling and creative outlet at the very beginning, like like very like say said very guiltily, right? I mean, <laughs> people were struggling. Now the office is reopening and it is a weird transition to kind of go back to the before times essentially. Yeah, I actually just found my uh, my entry badge to the inquire last night. 
I don't think I've I don't think I'd seen it in you know 19 months. Um, and you know, and I I have been thinking like you know because I, I I you know one of the things about like I, I love you know, what, like what Scott was saying like you know when you're when you're knuckling down on that drawing you need to have that silence and that isolation. But I really feel like a lot of my work has got stale over the last year or so. And part of it is, you know, it's the same stories, you know, I mean, there's, there's one story, there's COVID, you know, and that's the big story. And so I, you know, I feel like that's, um, that's part of it, but also, you know, just being at my drawing table and my, you know, my house for so long has, you know, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not around people like I used to be, and, you know, I'm, I'm not getting that kind of, external um you know inspiration and, and spark and if i could jump in too and just say for me i it's always been important to do local work um chicago cook county illinois uh, and so being in a newsroom where you could talk to the reporters who are covering those issues um is incredibly helpful and inspiring in a lot of ways in a lot of ways and a lot of times and losing that has been difficult so uh you know that'll that will change over the next few you know, months and years, I suspect. But right now, Kevin talked about trying to learn to understand the stories. I mean, nothing makes it easier than if you can walk up to the person who wrote it and say, you know, what is the mayor really that stupid? And the answer is, yep, <laughs> almost always. I actually do have a question for cartoonists who uh, maybe ha didn't have to adjust their day-to-day -day work life schedules that much because they were already working from home. Um, if you were in that situation, how do you get your inspiration? Because I know that the repetitiveness and what felt like house arrest for a year and a half, a blessed, healthy, safe house arrest for a year and a half, uh, it got really difficult to be creative sometimes uh, in that setting when you're seeing the same things every day. Um, so how did you all stay inspired before this or during this? <laughs> Where do you all get your inspiration? Is it from surfing Twitter? Like, how, and if the news is the same all the time, how much exponentially worse did that make it? Well, I felt like, um, I mean, I'm someone who I, I tend to get a lot of cartoonist block and then like go into horrible panics. Like, so I, I find it kind of sometimes a miserable experience trying to come up with something. And then oddly, when the pandemic hit, it was such a huge overwhelming story and it sort of affected me at the same time it was affecting everyone else that for a while I almost felt like it wasn't as much of a struggle I had you know when it was coming to be my turn to say something I felt like I think I've got some things to say um, and that went on for a little while and then with it just going on and on I could think of so many angles about the pandemic and I think yeah I did that one did that one twice did that you know and it, it is hard to and, you know, and I do, I do like being at home, but it is the feeling of like, you know, not bouncing off life and getting an infusion of, of new, you know, ideas and things happening or people saying things to me. So I, I have found it challenging. Yeah, I think the absence of connecting with the audience even and kind of getting, going out into the street and hearing people say different opinions in your own or just, you know, pulse, you get a pulse check of what's going on locally was very difficult at the beginning. And I think to your point, Sage, I mean, the pandemic is a great fodder machine, right? There's tons of different angles you can look at. Luckily, I'm in South Carolina, and we're continuing to kind of just do whatever we want to kind of let the pandemic roar, roar across the state. So, you know, I've got people, people rage against uh, from a political level and even at a social level. But at the same time, you know, I think just not always being able to kind of hear other people's voices and opinions one on one um, was a deficit at the beginning of the pandemic. And I think you're, there's so much you can get on Twitter, but that's always just the same echo chamber and, you know, the extremes. Trying to get the, the man on the street, the, you know, the average Joe, their, their opinion was difficult, not missing. Yeah. And I was actually, oh, sorry. No, oh, no, please go ahead, Sage. Um, back when I used to do sort of more single panel style um, for the Atlantic website and I was in the office, one thing I liked was that I sort of identified people in the office who would be honest with me and I would take sketches to them and, and show it to them. And they would, I would get an instant, like, no, I don't get it. Or, ah, that's a good one. And I would, it was reassuring. And I, sometimes I, you know, there were like three people and, you know, I knew who I trusted sometimes they didn't agree, but I would decide, you know, that was something that when I moved, my office moved home, then 
I felt like I would be like emailing it to people waiting to hear back. And I, I, I sometimes, because I knew also from showing it to people, sometimes they'd be like, ha, 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 no, I don't think it works. And I'd be like, oh, I know it worked, you know, um, but I, I would be missing that. So that was something that um, was an adjustment prior to the pandemic for me. I, I, still, I was just going to ask Sage, do you still do this? Because I, I still find I do a rough and I'll send it to a who's ever editing whatever thing I'm doing, but also to cartoon friends who I respect. Well, for the for the stuff I do for the Globe, I there's like three editors and I get plus a copy editor. So I'm not oh I know that they'll oh. they're like the bouncers. They'll keep me from embarrassing myself um, for when I do one offs now. Um, I, I, there were there were two people, a former editor I worked with and my brother pretty much. Um, and like sometimes people in, in my family, um, like there were some people I would show them and they would always be too polite and I wouldn't really know. Like they'd be like, you know, they wanted to say they liked it. Um, now, a lot of times I bother my brother <laughs> with it. Um, but sometimes I'll just do it and hope for the best. But yeah, I do like to kind of get some feedback in some sense that you know, I'm not missing some angle where I'm actually like offending somebody or, or something like that. So. Yeah, I, I, I do send my stuff to my editors, but I'll send it. I'll also send it to my two college roommates who after 20 years, we still ended up living within three miles of each other. Um, but I, you know, I got, uh, I got an interesting bit of feedback. I think it was last week that my cartoons, are, this is from one of my editors saying my cartoons are getting too grim. And I can't it's imagine why, I can't imagine why just, that's Or fine. you're blaming us? What's the deal? <laughs> say, Kevin, just because we're spiraling towards fascism and we're being killed by a pandemic, exactly. lighten up, man. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I just, I last night, you, I don't know if you saw the black thing on my hand. I went to a Randy Rainbow concert last night in DC and this is the vaccine stamp, but like he, he opened by saying, yeah, I'll get to talking about how Trump is a Cheeto in just a second. But I thought you all would like to talk about how great it is that things are livable now. So I appreciated that open, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, did the intensity of the situation we were living through inspire you? Uh, did you get the adrenaline rush or, you know, your brain uses fear as a superpower? Did that happen or was it harmful to your creativity? I it was think both. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, great fodder machine, like I said, and, you know, different angles to look at. I, I think the biggest thing now is just as we continue down this pandemic and it's become so obvious that there are so many players you know, working against the, the best interest of the common good. And those are coming like a frequent target for my strips. And it can be political. My governor, you know, is doing everything he can to make it, you know, difficult for schools to do the right things in terms of protecting kids to, you know, the school boards themselves, these meetings have devolved into just total propagandist and, you know, disinformation. So there's tons of material to work with. Um, but yeah, at the same time, it's, it can be so bleak. And, to Kevin's point, I mean, my, my cartoons do get a little grim, and I mean, they've always been a little pushy and a little harder edged, but now there are times I feel bad about some of the stuff I, I do, but I feel it needs to get out there. Yeah. I find um, that anger is anger is probably the best motivator for me. And so you, you mentioned bleak and, and dread. It, it's been hard because that's a hard emotion to get. I mean, what do you say other than, you know, death, bad? you know, darkness, let's, but, but anger for me has always been a, the best tonic to do the best cartoons. If you're pissed off, you're going to do good work here because and it's going to come through your, you know, uh, and so for me, the Trump era was uh, anger filled. Uh, and then uh, the, 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 the Biden era has uh, sort of just added fuel to that. So Moving it's forward, bad and, unless you're talking to an anti-vaxxer <laughs> who for some reason thinks that, you know, I'll go when I go. I've heard that argument far too often. No, dude, certain I mean, loved ones in Oregon of mine. <laughs> COVID, COVID almost killed me. Seriously. I was, there's a couple oh, of days geez. where I damn near died from the stuff. And so screw anybody, any anti-vaxxer, anyone who says this is a hoax, who says, don't wear a mask. I'll tell my grandma you said that. Yeah. Tell her to go to hell. <laughs> just say grandma scott says go to hell <laughs> noted if i'm allowed to talk with her at any point in the upcoming future i will do that <laughs> oh my god that's where the ang see this is where the anger is. Oh, 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 cartoon oh, fodder oh. i mean what a cartoon that would be it's like grandma, grandma. <laughs> 
it would get likes it would get shares it would get yeah. that outrage algorithmic boost right yeah. there you go it's yeah. all about that clicks <laughs> it is yeah and so actually speaking of like did you all have to struggle internally with the moral dilemma of do i try to feed into that algorithmic boost for anger and rage or uh how did you all manage that because I'm, I'm particularly interested in how social media is you know engineered to boost things that kind of reveal the worst side of human nature well, so I, I, will, I will say that you know i've gone especially over the last you know five years or so and i've gone through a couple of dark nights of the soul you know you know as a cartoonist like you know, I feel like I have a civic duty. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not making a whole lot of money on this, but I feel like I have a civic duty to speak out and, you know, try to, uh, you know, to, to boost things that, you know, like are for the common good and to, you know, to speak out against fascism yeah. and try to, you know, like scream into the night, like we need to get, be vaccinated and keep, you know, keep people safe. But yeah, to your point, you know, Alexandra, like it's, you know, I, I sometimes really get down like is what I'm doing even worth it you know does it matter to people uh, am I just contributing to the you know the online discourse and the anger and the, the yelling and that's that's really hard when you know, I've dedicated a lot of my life to doing this actually really funny you bring that up because I'm doing an English honors thesis that is going to be a documentary film on whether mass political satire of the last 20 years has helped in any way. <laughs> so the first the first half of this knock on wood uh, feature length film is going to be a chronology of the last 20 years worth of landmark moments in political satire, then the latter half will be interviews with people like you and asking you if you think you helped or not. Uh, so, uh, but no, and then I actually had a meeting with my thesis advisor yesterday, uh, and I've been very confident in this project for a while. And he said, you realize that it's impossible to measure if it helped or not, right? And I was like, oh no. So unfortunately, all we can do as practitioners is our best. <laughs> or what do you all think about that claim? Like. Have you come to terms with the fact that maybe all you're going to do is preach to the choir? And as a young person who wants to do this for the rest of my life, I've come to terms with that maybe being what happens. But I'd love to hear from experienced folks on if they've thought about that. I think there are people you're never going to get through to, right? Their, their minds are shut and they're going to listen to what they want to hear. Um, I try to do humor that, you know, definitely has an opinion. You know, it speaks to the choir at some level. Makes I mean, ultimately, I think our goal is to people think, right? So, and they may agree with what they hear, or they may disagree, and we may make. But I think at the end, also, I try to make people laugh. And I do get feedback every once in a while from people who I know don't agree with me politically, but say even though this the strip I did was aimed at something that they hold dear, I did make them laugh in spite of themselves. And I think if you can even just do that and make someone. You know, make make them laugh or piss them off, but I think if you have that kind of kind of have that effect, then you, they did for that moment think about the topic enough to hopefully crack that shell. Yeah, is it possible to do both, where you make them laugh and piss them off? I think I've managed at least once or twice. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow, impressive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, like, sometimes I feel like there's things that I'm very angry about, but I don't have a. I don't feel like like I'm so angry. I don't have a a clever or a, sort of some a cartoonized form of the anger and I feel like very frustrated because I want to say something and I want it to be like I know the result I want to have I want it to be powerful and people's yes that's exactly it and they send it around and somebody's mind gets changed but it's very I feel like I want to have a standard where it's not just me being stridently opining on something because then it would be like a call a you know opinion column or something um, but I do think that when there's some something clever or funny or something it kind of it might smuggle the concept into you know somebody thinks oh that's an interesting way you know and even if it's not something they agree with maybe they maybe it would get passed around to them because it made someone laugh or they said oh that you know I didn't think of it that way so yeah I'm a little more pessimistic frankly I just see that the both sides have really hunkered down and that and the, and the polls have certainly shown that there's not much of a middle anymore that you could convince. So are you just preaching to the choir? I do a comic strip called Prickly City and that allows me, it's a longer form. So we're uh, someone like Sage works in long form, which I really envy. Um, this allows me to expand on an idea. I'm a never, never Trump Republican. 
there's 10 of us in the country. <laughs> hey, I, w- I worked for the Lincoln Project for a year. It's a oh, did you really? Oh, God. Oh, yeah, that's I was the, the Lord's work. Thank you. Oh, you like us. Thank the Lord. <laughs> right. Yes, very much. Oh, it warms my heart to meet one of the 10 people. Who yes. <laughs> so, so for me, it's always trying to do something maybe a little more explanatory in my work or a little like both sides are doing playing this stupid ass game and let's change, you know, let's, you know, let's stop this bullshit and let's go forward and do the right thing. Um, but I, it's really, it's become harder and harder. And like Steve said, I think play, it's great when, when someone from the other side can does break through and sees the value of the work and the thought process. I mean, look at who I'm talking to right now. We're all smart people and we're trying to project a smart image. This isn't some, you know, MAGA BS. This is actually people being thoughtful and trying to present a thoughtful uh, point of view to people. Now, whether or not that breaks through, it's rare. And I, I just, I find that to be less and less and people working harder and harder to be more and more offended. And it makes the atmosphere for satire difficult. One thing I've thought a little bit about in terms of us doing our best is uh, at a minimum, people are going to be, this is actually something that Matt Worker said a long time ago that I committed to memory and most of my cover letters. Like no, people are going to be much more likely to spend time thinking, seeing and ingesting a political cartoon, i.e. a still visual image, than they are to potentially reading an op-ed. So at a minimum, you know, we're, arguably doing more work to get into people's heads than a lot of op-ed writers. And there's a lot of op-ed writers. So we're at the top of that totem pole. (laughs) And I would argue probably in terms of our effectiveness and our readership. Uh, But, you know, (laughs) Uh, but yeah. So anyone else have any comments on that front as to whether we're helping or hurting? No, I mean, you know, you know, I think, you know, all of us, you know, none of us are daily cartoonists anymore. You know, we're not doing like, you know, five or six, you know, cartoons, you know, a week. And I find it hard to, you know, to have any kind of balance between, you know, my, you know, my, my cartoons, like, um, you know, there are things I think that I could comment on on both sides, but if I only have one or two cartoons to do a week, I've got, you know, like my, you know, my faucet may be, may be leaking, and normally I would do a cartoon on that, but if you know my neighborhood's on fire, that's what's going to be my focus, you know, of, of my cartoon. That's kind of how I think about it. So like I feel like I'm always hitting the same things over and over again, um, and the same people. And you know, and I and I do get you know criticism like, why aren't you, you know, if you know liberals are doing this and conservatives are doing that, why are you always hitting the conservatives? Well, I don't have the time to, you know, to, you know, to do both except sometimes, and then I get, you know, really, and then I get emails and phone calls from the mayor, and uh, that's always fun. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's hard when you're, you know, when once, you know, when one group of people is just so extreme, you don't have the bandwidth to do, you know, to, to really, you know, you know, fire, you know, or use both as targets. Yeah, totally. Totally. And um, I know we were trying to save some of the questions for the end, but Matt Worker actually asked a question just now I'd love to pose to the group. Um, He says, I get that anger is a righteous motivator, but the advent of Twitter and Facebook seems to have moved us into a whole new unhealthy level of anger and bile. Maybe we all need to switch gears and provide the world with more images of puppies and kittens. What do you all think about that? Well, that's not in my job description, so I really don't want to do that. Um, But I do think you can inject intelligent intelligent commentary into an unintelligent environment yep i mean there are play comic strips like marmaduke that are out there that you know that you don't want the the opinion that there is out you know you can read that instead but to scott's point yeah we're here to make a point and to you know have an opinion and be intelligent about it and that's the diff- that's the diff- differentiator between what we do and what a lot what i see tweeted out there now, anger for anger's sake is 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 just stupid. I mean, I, I always point this out whenever I speak to groups and so on. Have you ever made a, a, an intelligent decision when you're angry? And you know, to a person, that's no. You know, you've always done probably something quite stupid when you're angry. So, I think controlled anger and rage at the right, you know, pinpointed at a at a good target uh, and well managed can be a pretty good tool, at least for me. 
and I think I think you know I'll, you know uh, probably everyone here who's speaking, you know, is you know is of that ilk where you know if we are anger angry at an issue, we're still going to go and we're going to do our research. We're going to you know look at the issues and you know try to read as much as we can before we commit pen or stylus to paper or iPad. Yeah. Well, at a minimum, the there's something special about the political cartoon as a medium where it's going to be fun. It's a cartoon. It's got the pop art element. So hopefully people enjoying that cartoon medium are going to see the work and maybe want to engage with it more as a result. Because like with Prickly City, for example, you've got that adorable little fox character. <laughs> and that always, for, throughout, frankly, it's an honor to be in this Zoom with you, uh, Mr. Stan, just because oh, oh, I would I would read your, I've read your cartoon since like age 10. <laughs> I've read your comics then. And I always I'm so love freaking old, thanks, dude. <laughs> I'm 21. Uh, I don't know if that makes a difference, but no, I would I would be attracted to that page of the comics uh, thing in the Washington Post because I thought that character was adorable. But well, and I, I would make me want to read your strip even as a 10 year old. But well, th no, thank you. I've heard that from other people, so thank you. Yeah, it's it's, a, it's put it in the guise of something like a like a cat meme um, yeah. or or a coyote <laughs> meme, and then and yeah, so people makes it a little more palatable for people, but they're. Lately, oh yeah, right. Of course, he's in the desert, right? Yeah. Well, don't worry. No, that's okay. My my son and never mind. My sons make fun of my comic strip all the time. So it's like, oh, what'd you do with the cat today? I'm like, it's a cat. <laughs> hey, cats are cool. <laughs> yeah, but he's a coyote. He's a coyote. Damn it, he's a coyote. <laughs> <laughs> you should have him wear a t-shirt for the next like months worth of strips and don't address it i'm a coyote not a cat I've joked, i have joked about it openly in the strip just because both characters get mis mis mislabeled which is exactly right. which is what i was looking for frankly i mean i remember skippy john jones at scholastic book fairs and i never knew if he was a siamese cat or a chihuahua and it was a huge uh, kitchen table debate with my family <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was families I was, in half <laughs> yeah did, did a better job of dividing this nation than trump <laughs> <laughs> i'm team chihuahua <laughs> well, that goes i was a deep memory that was in the back of my head like age seven geez okay oh geez but yeah, so I guess one question I have is for some of the freelancers here, and I'm asking on a personal level too. Um, so you all have your job and then you have freelance gigs on the side. So during the pandemic, when for me, at least it felt like I had a lot more time because I wasn't commuting anywhere and, um, you know, to back and forth to classes, commuting, um, walking back and forth to classes. Do, how do you prevent yourself from overloading with additional gigs, particularly during COVID when our, our schedules and lives were kind of scrambled? Well, I, I didn't prevent it. I, you know, yeah. uh, like my, my wife got laid off a year ago. So, you know, I was our, our income. Um, and I was, you know, I'm, you know, I will, I will fully admit I'm a little burned out. You know, from the from the past year, just because I was taking on any and every you know gig that was coming my way, um, and then living on the adrenaline and anxiety of you know being you know being the breadwinner. Um, so, yeah, it was it was it was difficult. Yeah, and I, I mean, I find it the same as before the pandemic, just with free, the nature of freelance work being so hard to control when the crunch time comes and you know because it's different groups of people they don't care that someone you know if you were in if it was all one organization they'd be like oh this department needs this from you yeah we'll wait you know this is like they don't want to hear about how you know someone else got to you first with another project and they want it now and and then there'll be oh. other times when you'd be thinking like i'd have the time now if if something you know but i'm waiting to hear back from somebody and yeah it's i i've i've been working with an organization where uh you know, they were saying like, okay, let's, you know, we're going to do this project. We're going to these two, do, do these two projects and then wait, wait, wait. And then, then in the last month, it was both projects are here right now for the same organization. Let's get it all done. Fun times. Boy, you, know, you, couldn't have, you couldn't have done this back in August or April. <laughs> Yeah, and you, and you don't want to let it drop because you want, you know, you want them to give you the next thing. Um, right. So, right. yeah. 
It's hard. It's you know it's um, it's dif it's it is it's difficult. Um, yeah. I'm looking forward to taking a little bit of a break afterwards. When would that break be? What's the light at the end of your tunnel? Uh, when they say that my the projects are done. Nice. <laughs> it's out of your hands. Yeah. That's a bummer. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, and to that effect, um, how did the pandemic affect you in terms of your creative and emotional motivation? And I, we kind of talked about this at the beginning, um, but generally speaking, just at your baseline during COVID, did you feel more motivated to work or did you feel more like the world is ending and none of this is worth it? Like, how was your, I guess, I guess this is kind of a mental health question, but um, how did you all feel? Were, was your baseline more depressed than normal or the same or uh were you like well you know what this is the last sprint until i probably get covid and die in the next couple of months like what where were you i think at the beginning of the pandemic i felt like a lot more free time right like we were saying we're all kind of in our homes nothing else to do can't go anywhere my social life took a hit but creatively you know i used to do indie comics before i did editorial cartoons and so i went back into that and started you know, revisiting stuff i used to work on 20 years ago or you know pursue new ideas and, and longer form cartoons and sage i love your stuff because it is long form and i really you know i do like a panel like a three panel four panel strip now but to have page upon page of stuff is, is a totally different kind of storytelling so that was my kind of revival during the pandemic was to kind of get back in sync with that cartoon of Steve from you know 20 30 years ago I felt like early on it because I stress out so much over coming up with cartoons I felt like it was useful that it put it in perspective like I could be dead of COVID tomorrow it's just a cartoon and then as it went on and like I'm vaccinated and I'm probably not going to be dead I probably do need to make sure I come up with this cartoon the pressure's back on but yeah that was kind of my evolution uh, like I said, I, I caught it and it was horrible. Uh, but halfway through it, you mentioned my comic strip. I had a deadline. And so I was extremely ill. I mean, I had to dictate the strip to my wife. I have an assistant who helps draw it. And um, so, yeah, that I'd say that for me, there is a lot of Henri coming into when COVID started and, and has just lifted pretty recently, really. I can't speak to the others, but for me, it was always like this dark cloud and it was, it's, it's hard to work through that. Yeah. Like early on, I had uh, a couple of projects that I was doing and it was, it was a slog. And I remember, um, you know, like calling up uh, a, a client and just saying, you know, I know like I'm a week behind in, in sending you stuff. I'm really sorry. It's just depressed about you know everything and they're like oh it's okay so are we we're you know we're you know and so you know i i feel like that was you know, like because we were all having a shared experience oh, right. you know there was a little bit of uh you know a given of a give and take but um you know and you know and to scott's you know what scott just said you know i think it, you know some of us are still coming out of it even now because it's still going on yeah, I was talking to, I was did some fill-in work on talk radio too. And it was remarkable how many people were dealing with the same. I think we had a national depression going on, but which was, you know, <laughs> given what else we were going through. Oh, totally. It's probably warm. I, remember, I yeah. remember during the week of the election, like I, I don't really slip into depressive moments, but there's a week of the election where I didn't know if this massive job I'd taken on with the Lincoln Project was going to look terrible on my resume for the rest of my life. And I thought, what if he loses? And I guess that's how a lot of people working on campaigns feel. It's, gosh, I just invested this much time of my precious life into working on something that didn't work out. And so I felt depressed for the state of our nation, state of COVID, will I ever get to have a normal young adult life? <laughs> if, if, if Trump's elected, I don't know what's going to happen in the next four years and beyond and also uh you know this big part of my life slash identity professionally might not bode well but uh the second that we won the, our spirits were lifted <laughs> but yes yeah, Scott can I ask the panel a question and I, I mean this because I mean for me the work is so personal I mean we talk about how during the course of our work we have to cloister ourselves and be alone and and, and really feel what's happening. And it can be a myriad of, uh, of issues. For me, it's the violence up in Chicago that breaks my heart. Do, have, do any of you have that same issue with dealing with, with, with 
with the issues you're, you know, you're, you're having to face, do you take them? I mean, that purse line, do they affect you that profoundly? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, just for me, like I remember um, a couple of years ago, we were having just a spate of, uh, you know, of, of shootings in Cincinnati and there were like 15 children who had been shot, you know, just accidentally. And I did a cartoon and I, you know, I did it. And then, you know, like my wife came home and saw me in like just the blackest of moods. Uh, because yeah, you have to, you have to like internalize all of this. Otherwise I don't think what we do is effective. Uh, you know, it has to be emotional. And I, I felt like, I almost feel like I was equally emotionally affected by sort of what's been going on politically over since 2016 um, as um, with COVID and kind of continue to be in maybe more scared about where we're still at um, with that stuff. Um, you know, I feel like it's, it's a different experience now that the government is currently in the hands of, you know, not really a cacistocracy and it's, you know, people who are, you know, experts who, you know, have, have people of good faith governing rather than lurching around. But that this is like, I am I feel like that could lead to complacency because like I've been reading the Harry Potter books with my son and I keep thinking that it reminds me of, you know, yes, the story yeah, starts, right. Voldemort's off stage, yeah. he's banished and the whole series is like Voldemort's get, getting the troops not back. back. <laughs> the government's trying to convince everyone that everything's fine. Oh, she right. was a prophet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Man, I could about that. No one's talking yet. about it. Yeah, I hope I hope it I hope it turns out okay. So actually, so Sage, I have a question for you because you have a young son, and you know all these things are affecting our future, and you know has that influenced your cartoons and the, you know and what you're, you know like you know I, you know I, I I feel like I'm doing you know I you know I don't have any kids so I'm I can be kind of selfish in, in terms of how I feel but you know it has 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 that and you know like the sort of the perilousness of you know of the, of the future has that affected you in, in in what you've drawn and what you've tried to say i mean i feel like i feel like politically i'm very worried you know and that that has affected you know at times i've gotten more sort of just come out and say you know I, i'm usually trying to do a certain style that's expected of me but at, there have been a few times when i've just kind of come out and said we need to worry about this um and also i mean this is probably more just because my during the pandemic my world kind of narrowed so much to like i'm home and my son is here underfoot with me and um you know he's, he's the kind of kid who expects, well, he's not, he's not one who's left to his own devices easily. So, um, you know, I would even, you know, he, and he's also kind of like a screen addict. So I was at times trying to like hide my screen. So then I felt very cut off. So I have done a, <clears throat> a number of cartoons where my solution to that was to like exploit him himself for material because he's kind of like, okay, I have a specimen in front of me of one of the many children um, around the world who are going through this experience. Um, so, you know, I do worry about how how this generation is affected by um, the experience they're going through. I, I kind of feel like um, just from, you know, friends who have older children, it, I, I kind of think it might be harder on the kids who are slightly older because they kind of know what they're missing out on and they're like, you know, formative yeah. relationships and things Correct. like that. I feel like <laughs> the little kids, are, they're kind of, you know, this is just how life is and and they're kind of kind of adaptable but you know there's definitely you know the feeling of of them not getting socialization and and being scared of of you know it it's interesting you know my husband my my son wants to watch the news all the time because he he's always wants to find out when he can get vaccinated and whenever they have an announcement about how it's closer he'll like jump up and jump for joy and oh that just seems like an odd <laughs> an odd thing to be focused on as a as, child that little so oh yeah, yeah speaking of the emotions and the generational gaps and I mentioned my grandma earlier but in my very early stages of being a political cartoonist a lot of what I've tried to think about or subconsciously and consciously in doing cartoons about Trump and Trump supporters is 
I know my grandma's coming from a place that is understandable given what she was exposed to as a person throughout a lot of her life, but she's also doing things that are deeply harmful to herself and her community. And thank goodness she's not active on Facebook or, you know, spreading this disinformation. Uh, but a lot of the emotional work for me is thinking about it's a weird form of compassion where I love you and I know you're trying to come from a good place, I think, uh, but you're doing so much harm. And I don't want to say evil, but you're spreading evil, I guess. Um, so how do I talk about these issues and condemn evil in the gravest possible terms while also doing it in a way that shows compassion and also is persuasive to those people at all? Because I think actually did a TED talk through TEDx Georgetown last year um, called How to Talk Politics Productively. And the thesis of that talk was um, you're not, and this was me talking, you know, in all my 20 year old wisdom, uh, uh, you're not going to change anyone's minds by telling them to their face that they're wrong. I think that's true. I know that's been true of me. Like, I don't think anyone is persuaded by being looked in the eye and said, you're an idiot, told you're an idiot. Um, I think people are persuaded when the other side is more patient or compassion towards their point of view, even when the other side feels like that's not a valid approach, <laughs> even when the other side is furious and feels like they're the evildoers. I, in all my inexperience, might argue that the best approach is to be, at least on the surface, uh, to give off the appearance of understanding to those people. But what do you all think about that take? <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a, it used, I mean, God, I'm going to sound so damned old. It used to be if an idiot was an idiot, you had to call him an idiot. I mean, because we were the only ones who were going to say that the emperor is naked as, you know, as the day he was born. I mean, that's just was the job. But you're right. Now you can't tell someone they're a moron because they believe that, you know, uh, COVID came from, uh, you know, the, the, the Martians. And they, um, we were talking about this on the car ride home, my wife and I, this this morning. And we're just, there's, there's someone, we're familiar, a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend. And this woman lost her son and is convinced that, um, you know, it still believes that this, this was sent by the government to kill people because they want to kill people, apparently, is the thing government wants to, you know, do. Um, and how, how, as a commentator, do you respond to that other than just say, you're a moron? And I, so, so I don't know what the answer is. I'll throw it out to the, to the panel because I don't know what the answer is. I did one cartoon that I had been reading about how they people were sort of at their wits end trying to persuade people with you know facts and logic and reasoning and that they they had gotten a lot of persuadable people and now they were just these people who were kind of digging in their heels about you know they believe these conspiracy theories so you know I was just thinking well maybe if these people want to believe conspiracy theories you know you should make up conspiracy theories that will make them want to get vaccinated. So like, you know, oh, that Microsoft chip, everyone who has one of those Microsoft chips implanted is going to be offered a lucrative job with Bill Gates or, you know. Um, oh, yes. good Lord. Is this where like we are? <laughs> so, I mean, it was tongue in cheek, but I was actually thinking like, maybe somebody should try these things on, nice. on people who want to believe this wacky stuff because logic is not working. So. Chips are a, a, a lib spray like anti-lib spray <laughs> the radioactivity they admit is like lib be gone or something right. like that yeah. <laughs> Rachel, I mean, we're all we're already tracked with our with our phones every you know every big company knows where we are and i just i wish people could you know could just make that little bit of leap of you know in, in their logic of like oh god it's just it's painful it, it's it's just so painful how Oh, wow. Yeah, it's hard to be patient when the, the patients come to the death toll these days, right? I mean, the pandemic is just crazy. And the second we can kind of start swaying people or turn their, make them change their tune and we can stop with death. I mean, that's that's the, the thing, right? I mean, during the Trump years, oh, I felt like we are in an abusive relationship and there are people who are persuaded, you know, they could kind of, they eventually see it, right? And there are people who clearly, you know, January 6th shows that never saw it. But the pandemic is something different. I mean, the pandemic is just, the disarmation is, is so crazy. And yeah, I think you're right, Alex. It'd be great if we could just put on a smiley face and kind of coax them around and eventually they would get there. But it's like we waited Trust for me, and I hate, 
I hate to let you all, I won't let you all too far into my family drama, but like, in all honesty, the coaxing approach has barely worked either, but my gut tells me it would be more effective ideally than the yelling approach. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know if anyone saw this, but you know, here in Ohio, we had, um, one of our state reps invite a doctor and a nurse, you know, get to give testimony at our state house where they both claimed that the vaccine made them magnetic and they were trying to stick uh, keys onto oh, their necks and chest and they kept falling off. I saw that right. But they, you know, but they're... And this didn't disprove their theory? No. If it made you magnetic, that would be awesome. <laughs> oh god it was oh yeah there is your keys again <laughs> uh hey everyone this is uh your countdown clock uh we've about got five minutes or so left i saw there was a few questions in here if you cool. want to maybe yeah sure you and a uh i mean we may run a few minutes late but uh just want to let you know it is uh five minutes till four Excellent. How about we start with this question from 314, the first question we got from Paul Burge. He said, uh, how, during COVID, how did you replace having discussions with other journalists about what was going to be in the news that particular day? I missed, I missed it terribly. I really did. And, it, and it's hard. I mean, I was still on the editorial board of the Chicago Tribune peripherally. So I could sit on, the, they had two editorial board meetings a week, Zoom meetings. So Zoom, um, which I has been a great you know, subsidy for that, for that, for me, I can't speak for the others. You know, uh, yeah, occasionally, but, um, and then, you know, interactions with other journalists on, you know, on, on Twitter and social media. Yeah. Same. Yeah, just reading the news and Twitter and all that. Did you do that before though? <laughs> like what <laughs> changed? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Oh, you did both. You did. You, yeah, you but, but I did. I mean, I wasn't really in contact constant with the newsroom before anyway. So right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do all cartoonists have a group chat where they talk about stuff <laughs> or how does that work? What, what are your networking or not, not networking? That's not the word. What's your creative process with regard to talking with other cartoonists? Like, do you have a small little group of cartoonists that you bounce ideas off of? I know I do. <laughs> but uh, how does that work for you all, if at all? I can, I'll jump in real quick and say, yeah, I have a handful of uh, Mike Thompson, uh, Rob Rogers, Ted Rawl talk to him almost every day. Um, and then uh, Marshall Ramsey and some others who I talk to and stay in touch with. The, um, there's a couple other cartoonists who are who do the exact same thing that I do. And so we occasionally have chats where, you know, because we kind of, nobody knows the experience that we have better than each other. And so like, we'll sometimes say, I need I need to, to vent or I, I'm having trouble thinking of something. And um, it's it's useful and also just, you know, giving heads ups about, you know, little tips on things to do or not do, um, it's helpful. And the camaraderie professionally and personally, I'm sure was a huge help during COVID, or it was for me. Uh, next question from Clay, this one should go fast. Did you ever get to the point of working from home during the pandemic that when you had to put on pants, it felt really weird? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what, are, what are pants? Yeah. <laughs> In Britain, it's underwear, but here it's, you know, the stuff that I, goes on top of the other I, for you know i was i i wasn't a zoom call uh it was a uh and it was a big call with uh, you know a, a client and they had a whole you know, whole bunch of people on it and halfway through i was just like okay i just want i want everyone to be honest who here is wearing pajama pants <laughs> everybody was wearing pajama pants and i mean like you had people in you know nice you know nice shirts ties so yeah pants I had to attend an event in the last two weeks. It's the first time, seriously, I didn't realize until that moment that two years, almost a year and a half, where I had worn long pants. And it felt like, you know, when you walk through a spider web, it's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. it was horrible. It's funny. My dad uh, works at a think tank and I, he was hiring interns, some of which were like people I vaguely knew from LinkedIn. And I know that he was wearing pajama pants during his interviews of these interns who I knew during their high stakes internship applications, which was a fun power thing for me to know. Uh, but here's another question uh, from Colm Rogers. How do you tackle a politician who is better than you are at, at exaggerating his own faults? 
That's a big question and a very cool essay question that, frankly, I should put in my documentary. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know if this is what Colm is addressing, but it's sort of like Donald Trump, who, how do you cartoon a cartoon, you know? And we have, now we have what happens, the, the worst thing that can happen in politics is success because it gets, these guys are not very smart and not very creative and they see something that works. So we got a lot of Trump like politicians nowadays who, when they say something stupid uh, or preposterous and they get called on them, they double down on it. Now, how do you cartoon about that? Guys, I mean, we all face that. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, when, when you do have a public, you know, a state legislator calling for people to, you know, show how magnetic they are, what do you do? I mean, you know, I, 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 don't... Have, an, I have an idea. Have you all seen uh, our cartoon press? President, the animated sitcom by Stephen Colbert. Oh, one, yeah. wow, I could talk about this for a while and it is for darn. Uh, but one thing I found really interesting about that show is they almost humanized Trump where they, in my opinion, they reeled back some of the crazy and made him seem like just this, almost a dad who's egomaniacal and out for himself, but uh, significantly less psychopathic than he is in real life. And I thought that was an interesting and potentially mandatory approach to making a sitcom about Trump. Trump, but kind of ma almost making it look like, oh my gosh, if a normal person did these things and we've made him out to look more normal in this show, look how crazy that would be. So I thought that was an interesting approach, but mm. there's one option for how one could tackle it. And then uh, JP, do we have time for this one last question, which is a nice bookend, I feel like. No, oh, absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, from Russell, do you have a sense of what a future quote unquote normal might look like as an artist, commentator, or just as a person? Or have you abandoned the concept of a future normal and are accustomed to an adaptive eternal present? If you need to read that again, it should still be in the Q&A. <laughs> like the latter. <ladder. laughs> yeah. I don't know what to expect. And I'm just... Sorry. I thought I, when, when back when we got vaccinated, I thought we were going back to normal. And now I just, who knows? Yep. Yeah. And with, and politically too. I, I mean, yeah, I feel like, yeah, it's like we've crossed into this just unknown where, you know, I, I feel like all the rules are just out the window. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, I mean, and that's one of the things I used to tell Lincoln Project doubters after the election was over was like, look, the fight's not over. I mean, you'd think that would be obvious, but just because Trump's gone doesn't mean that however many million people who voted for him or their beliefs are gone. Like, it's like almost like the, the king of the bad guys has been defeated, but the bad guys are still there. So obviously the fight's not over. It is still the Trump era, obviously. But I, I think, think he's going to run again in 24 too, by the way. I mean, he's made well, every, he's definitely. showing every side of doing it. So do you think Ron DeSantis will run? Like, do you think Ron DeSantis, if he does run, would beat Trump? No, no, no. no. Would, you, I think you've probably seen a Trump DeSantis ticket in 24. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Darn. Can we end it on a better, happier thing? <laughs> Can we talk about the coyote? Can we end it on that? <laughs> What's the coyote up to on this fine Saturday afternoon? They're deciding why they're so sad. So it's really not going to happen. Work with me. <laughs> you ever heard of the yes and comedy principle? Can we take it and build on it? <laughs> Still waiting for the and. I need the affirmation and the bill, but yeah, no, so here's the thing. Real wonderful quick, pot. Yeah. Real quick, super quick editorial cartooning. I hate the question is editorial cartooning dying. It can't die. They've tried to kill us for thou literally thousands of years. We do what we do because we have to, and there is no way in God's green earth, there will not be editorial cartooning and some guys or another. So those who hate us or hate what we do, <laughs> we're around forever. Sorry, dude. Well, like you know, I mean, I mean <laughs> Alexandra, you, I mean, you are, you know, I mean, you're, you're exactly what, you know, what Scott was saying. I mean, you're, you know, I, I remember years ago, we were all kind of, you know, standing around saying, Jesus, just a bunch of old white guys, you know, and that's it. And, you know, I mean, you know, like, it's like, like seeing like your submissions and stuff from like the locker award and like other oh. people who are, and, but other people who are like, you know, um, you know, in, in middle age, who are now like getting into uh, you know art and the diversity of the people who are doing that, it's oh. been really, it's been you know, if there's one like small silver lining to the last five years, 
I think it's it's inspired people to you know to use their voice and use their art to you know to speak out about how horrible things are. Yeah, actually, it's fun. Here's a helpful, hopeful bookend. I remember the morning after the election, I was in an AP Lane class uh, for first period, and everyone was silent. And one conclusion that we came to after everyone managed to speak up, and there were actually some tears from us as little 16 year olds, um, was that at a minimum, we now know how bad things actually are, as opposed to the bad, the you know, worms remaining in the woodwork where we weren't quite, we were kind of aware they were there, but we didn't know how bad things were. But at least Trump has brought out both the people and the politicians who lack a spine. And now we know exactly how bad the problem is. And to me, that lack of ignorance, <laughs> that being in the know is encouraging, especially as I go for try to go forth and conquer into a career of this and a life in this country, where now I know exactly how many people don't care if I live or die. And to me, that's something. So with that, yeah, I, I turn it back to Yay. JP. <laughs> hey, no, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank Alexander for uh, moderating this and thank yes, all our panelists. Uh, also, come on, coming up at 4.30, uh, kind of folding into this idea, there is a panel on the legal challenge, challenges to parody, uh, which I think everyone here and everyone out there will want to watch because it's getting hairy out there. So again, thank you all and see you in about 30 minutes. Cool. Thank Thanks, you. That was fun. Thank you all so much. Yeah, this is great. Uh, yeah, totally. Sage, I got to say that your description of the pr creative process is one of the best I've heard ever. So thank you for that. I'll have to go back and watch the video to see what I said. But <laughs> you just talked about the pain, how painful it is. I'm like, yeah, every day or the days I have to do it, it still hurts. It's like, it's the only way to put it. Every time, every time I come with, come up with a cartoon, I feel like I will appreciate this because I, I don't have, there's no guarantee there's another one that's going to come next time. Yes, exactly. It feels like grace that